Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Dr. Keith Mitchell, Minister of Education, the Honourable Emlyn Pierre, other Ministers of Government and Parliamentarians, Chairperson of the T.A. Marichaux Community College, Principal and Staff of the College, Parents and Graduates, Members of the Media, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen all. Graduation addresses are usually meant to be more motivational than substantive. And as a famous St. Lucian politician once said, they should be like a good miniskirt, long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to be interesting. Let me warn you that this address will be more substantive and more like a knee-length dress because we are not in normal times. And you, the graduating class, are not stepping out of the college to a world in which all expectations still hold. So please bear with me as I try to take you on a more reflective journey that hopefully will guide you. Every time we experience catastrophe, we proclaim that things are getting from bad to worse and every disaster which seems more threatening than any previous experience is described as unprecedented. And so it is with the year 2020, a year when the world was brought to its knees in silence while an invisible killer, more powerful than the weapons of the mighty, caused rich and poor, strong and powerless, to iso isolate in our silence, not unlike the ten plagues visited on the land of Egypt to humble the mighty Pharaoh. 2020 will be indelibly etched on the minds of contemporary generations for the medical tsunami that it unleashed, followed by the economic devastation and the ruin that followed. And just when we thought that this tidal disaster had washed away so many, its second surge is taking even more lives. All of this follows the successive shock and awe only three years earlier in 2017 of hurricanes Irma and Maria, which left a trail of death and destruction in the Caribbean and total damage estimated at more than 65 billion US dollars. As small developing states, the size and scale of our destruction, damage and loss in our successive seasons of pain may not be readily appreciated by those who are bigger and richer. But perhaps if we scale up our losses from the worst regional hurricanes to their parameters, they might just grasp the comparative magnitude of our pain. 39 persons were killed by Hurricane Ivan in Grenada. 29 lives were lost in Dominica with a population of 70,000. Every life matters. But if this hurricane had happened in India, the corresponding scale of life's loss would have been 3.2 million souls. The estimated damage and losses in Grenada from Ivan in 2004, 1.1 billion US dollars. From Dominica for Maria, 1.3 billion US dollars. In both cases, 200% of GDP, which had this happened in the UK, would have amounted to 5.6 trillion US dollars. Every one of the 1,400 inhabitants of Barbuda had to be evacuated. Had this storm hit Florida with the same results as Barbuda, it would have meant the evacuation of all 20.6 million Florida residents. Well, maybe we are over-dramatizing the reality. But human tragedy on any scale is tragedy, despite the numbers, the nationalities, or the ethnicities. What is clear is that 2020 is the year in which all of our worst challenges, pandemic, economic implosion, and climate change, join hands, each reinforcing the other and compounding our difficulties. I want to turn now to what is the new normal and its implications for you. As a result of this, so many of the habits of our daily life have changed that even as things stabilize, we cannot truthfully say that they are normalized. It is increasingly clear that nothing can be business as usual, and we will now have to adjust to what is being called the new normal. 
In most of the public commentaries and the reflections on our current situation, the narrative has been predominantly one of doom and gloom. But the reality is that the flip side of adversity is radical opportunity. Because adversity is so disruptive, it also carries deep within its dynamic the seeds of transformation. If you think about it, that's what our old folk wisdom tells us in sayings like, what do break you will build you. And this is what we are also supposed to learn from literature. Shakespeare tells us, and I quote, sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the tod, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in its head, unquote. This speaks to our resilience, our capacity to bounce back better no matter what the odds. Look at how Grenada recovered from Hurricane Ivan. Look at how Dominica built back better from Hurricane Maria. In nature, recovery is part of the natural cycle of life. But in society, recovery only comes from courage, determination, and resilience. My main message to you graduates today is to urge you to dig deep, look beyond the physical distancing and the social isolation of this moment, look further down the road of restriction to the pathways of possibility that the current situation presents. So what then does the new normal mean for you as young persons graduating with high hopes and expectations and with dreams of accomplishment? The new normal has some distinct, discernible characteristics, some of which are immediately obvious, and others which are only now hinted as future trends. Here are some of them which should be of concern to you. 1. The change in perspective on jobs. COVID-19 has changed many jobs, putting some in new perspective. Think, for example, about cleaners and sanitation workers. Where would we be today if they had stayed at home like the rest of us? Many parents, especially those with kindergarten-age children, have renewed appreciation for teachers after months of having to deal with at-home instruction and do some of it themselves. Second point are the changes in the way work is undertaken. The shutdown of economies worldwide following the pandemic resulted in the suspension of work for most jobs, but there were several occupations which were able to be remotely undertaken. In North America, and largely applicable to us too, the jobs identified by the World Economic Forum that showed the largest percentage of workers with an ability and actually telecommuting including architecture and engineering, 84%, computer and mathematical computation jobs, 83%, business and financial operations, 77% of workers telecommuting, online educational instruction, 72%, and legal occupation, 71%. There were some jobs which involved some measure of telecommuting, and these were in life and physical, life, physical and social science. 41% involved some telecommuting. 36% of managers were telecommuting. Office and administration staff, about 28%. And community and social services, 26%. Now the list of jobs which involve practically no telecommuting, 96 of them were the protective services. 96 of them were production workers, 94% were construction workers, 92% food preparation workers, 90% transportation workers, 87% cleaning and maintenance staff, 81% maintenance and repair, and surprisingly in the U.S. context, 50% of the workers in healthcare were not able to telecommute. In our case in the OECS, however, these figures would correspond to our reality, except that for the health personnel, because I believe in our case, 
we would have shown a 98% presence at work. They were the our frontline trench in this pandemic, our health workers. The third point is the new emerging careers. Many jobs have been going through changes, but this process has been accelerated by the pandemic, by the economic shutdown and the pace of online everything. One positive dimension of the pandemic is that it has resulted in a fast tracking of digital transformation in virtually all areas of daily life, regardless of socioeconomic status or geographic location, the digital revolution is enabling people to transform their lives and to seize opportunities that were formerly not available to them. It has been more than 15 to 20 years when we've spoken about the opportunities in education for online learning. And our governments have tried over time to gradually implement those measures. But the urgency of COVID has meant that we have done in two months what we failed to do in 20 years. I have seen rural farmers in Kenya using their cell phones to market and sell their produce and using the mobile money transfer service called M-Pesa, bypassing the traditional money transfer agencies who have been charging before exorbitant fees. The fourth area is that skill sets and requirements are rapidly changing on account of three factors, the realignment to our post-COVID reality, the increase in what we call hybridization of knowledge, that is transdisciplinary fusions of knowledge, and the change in character of assessment and accreditation. While first degrees are now considered to be foundational qualifications in many advancing countries, there are also occupations for which an academic degree is really no longer useful. In fields such as marketing, accounting, business strategy, digital media, HR, project management, the pace of change of knowledge and practice now requires professional certification, or IT as well, professional certification if one is to be competitive in these fields. In fact, just last year, the ACCA, the Association of Chartered Accountants, announced that even if one has a PhD in accounting, you will get no waivers in your pathway towards the ACCA accreditation. Relatedly, Increasingly, even degree programs are becoming modular and the traditional courses are given way to modules, which can come from a broad catalog of multidisciplinary areas. These customizable degrees, therefore, allow you to develop knowledge and competence in niche areas in what is an increasingly complex global knowledge economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is modular and digital. As you graduates seek to define your path from TAMCC, take time to think carefully about your career pathway. It is no longer just about degrees or paper credentials. Industry accreditation, soft skills such as interpersonal relations, other skills such as critical thinking and problem solving, design thinking, are the currency of tomorrow that are already in circulation today. Now, all what I've described is only part A in understanding the nature and the educational implications of the new normal. Part B, which we now come to, of equal importance, is what I call the knowledge of possibility. The knowledge of possibility. This knowledge is what will awaken you to the opportunities that exist and will inspire you to recognize and realize the potential that lies within, regardless of the circumstances of birth, time, and place. It all starts with the aspiration to greatness, because there is that capacity in all of us. Have no illusions about it, but it's simple. If you aspire, you've got to perspire. 
difficulties and challenges can be seen as problems or they can be seen as what they truly are, opportunities. Life sends us opportunities that are only packaged as challenges. But when overcome, these challenges reveal to us our resilience, our inventiveness, and they place us on a new platform of accomplishment. So what you need to do is to look in three directions to unleash your own greatness. Look beyond, look around, and look within. Let me first give you an example of failed possibility from my own life experience so that you can understand why ambition must be positively channeled. One of my primary schoolmates in St. Lucia, who was thought to be a dull student throughout our primary career and dropped out at primary level, eventually became a multimillionaire from getting involved in the drug trade. He eventually tried to diversify out of the trade but was gunned down at about 35 years of age. He lived fast and furious, and he died in anguish and regret. Now what were the lessons of his life and death for me? For this young man, after having been labeled a failure in school, to have defied the law and the odds, to be so financially successful, is clearly an invitation of his evident entrepreneurial ability, if only access to legitimate opportunity was easily provided in our society. On the other hand, he clearly paid the, the ultimate price for his misdirected choices. So we can't just blame society, we have personal responsibility balancing this. So let me now take a quick simultaneous look at what I meant by looking beyond and looking around. And I want to tell you the story, which I'm positive that you've never heard, about two Grenadians alive today who are relatively young, who exemplified Grenadian excellence to the world. Dr. Dwayne Carter, a GBSS boy raised in Tempe, and a graduate of Tamsisi, just like yourselves, who sat on the same benches that you now sit on. Duane migrated to the United States to study medicine with a passion for understanding and curing diseases that plague the human race. He went on to doctoral studies in cell biology at the University of Texas. In 2016, he joined Organovo Holdings, Inc., as a postdoctoral researcher in liver tissue bioengineering with a focus on modeling progressive liver diseases. Throughout his graduate training, Duane received numerous awards for meritorious research from national scientific meetings. But many Grenadians have excelled internationally, so what really makes him an example? Let me show you the following video. Imagine a world where our children are living to the age of 150, 170. Imagine the ability to grow full body parts of a human being. Organovo is at the base unit of the beginning of building and growing body parts. These folks have the keys to the rewriting of the human body. Organovo does 3D bioprinting. We're talking about taking living cells and putting them into a structure with a bioprinter that ends up creating a living tissue. If Organovo does its job well, they have deep impact on the operating system of the rest of the planet. In 2004, the first lab really did something innovative, which was taking an old HP inkjet printer and take the ink out of the cartridge and put cells in the cartridge. And they demonstrated that they could take those cells and, and basically spray them out of that inkjet and they would survive. Up until this technology existed, there was simply no way to take human cells and make a three-dimensional tissue that had architecture that mimicked the native tissue. Much like 3D printing itself works, they're going to be working with plastic materials. We're working with cell and gel materials. So if you imagine taking our liver and breaking it up layer by layer into little three-dimensional pixels, that's essentially what the printer is doing. 
and the printer lays those down and then they form the tissue that we're targeting. We're using them to be better than animal models in drug discovery. Instead of relying on clinical trials, you're using human tissues prior to the clinical trial to understand how a drug performs. It's rewriting the rules of uh, toxicology testing. Imagine a world where the drugs that we take every day are safe and don't surprise us with toxic side effects. We're also rewriting the way that surgeons can think about approaching patients. We need a rewrite to actually treat patients who are in dire need of organ transplants. There are only transplant organs for 10% or less of the people out there who could really benefit from them and create long-lasting alternatives to whole organ transplant. That's really the end game. While it is a lovely idea that you would print and deliver an entire liver, you don't actually need an entire organ. What I'm talking about is enough tissue mass, a large enough piece of functional liver that you could keep them from needing a whole organ transplant. Aspirationally, we'd like to do as full of organs as possible with bioprinting. Our goal is to have a dramatic impact on medical research and on the practice of medicine. So the impact and success rates of surgeries are gonna go way up. Therefore, life expectancy will go way up. That is a deep, impactful rewrite on the planet. Here is the Tempe boy who was involved in changing the face of medicine in the world. To convince you that greatness is not a dream, but is within your grasp, and that one Grenadian to the world is not a fluke, here is another example of Grenadian excellence to the world. Dr. Nicholas Earl Braffitt, Carrier Coupon, a Mount Morris and Presentation College boy. I have no video on Dr. Braffitt, but allow me to extensively snapshot his biography. Successful engineer, technologist, entrepreneur, multinational business executive, and private equity and venture capital investor. He has several patented inventions. He was a pioneer in the development of low-cost cell phones for developing countries and the development of software solutions for integrating product design with supply chain and manufacturing systems. He led teams that co-developed several successful products, including PDAs, cell phones, digital cameras, embedded cameras, and guess what? You'd find this exciting. Your game consoles and power supplies. His career includes a bachelor's honors degree from McMaster's University, a master's degree from the University of Waterloo, and an honorary PhD from the University of the West Indies. On the entrepreneurship front, hear this. Earl Braffitt started several successful businesses, creating annual revenues ranging from 50 million to 6 billion US dollars. He was the co-founder or is the co-founder and partner of Riverwood Capital, a private equity firm that manages 2.2 billion US dollars and with investments in the US, Brazil, Argentina, Chile and Israel. He was the managing director of WRV, a $400 million capital venture with investments in the US, China, Japan and Israel. As Chief Technology Officer of Flectronics, he transformed Flectronics over 12 years from a 200 million US dollar contract manufacturer to a 30 billion US dollar global leader in electronics manufacturing services. With 240,000 employees, hear this, almost twice the population of Grenada, and operations in 35 countries. So when I advise you to look beyond and to look around, these two examples of excellence and possibility from your own soil, Dr. Carter and Dr. Braffitt, can provide that inspiration. There is no need to look outside of our geography for inspiration. 
And then having done this, look within yourself to unleash your potential. As Dr. Braffitt told a 1982 graduating class at his alma mater, and I quote, the world awaits you, but it is not your degree that the world is awaiting. And he said further that they should define success, and I quote, not based on money, fame, or fortune, but on the impact that you have on the lives of others. End of quote. So friends, graduates, look beyond to see the possibilities. Look around to see the examples and the opportunities. And look within for the will to succeed and the vision to accomplish. I thank you.